What would you say to writers who are capable of writing concisely, but are scared they won't be taken seriously? Uh, get a new job. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Scripted Podcast. My name is John Parr. I'm the writer community manager here at Scripted and I am joined by... Kevin O'Connor. I'm the marketing director here at Scripted. That's right. And Kevin, we've got an awesome show today. We've got our guest, Josh Burnoff. Josh has co-authored three books on business strategy, including the bestseller Groundswell. Uh, he studied mathematics at the PhD program at MIT, uh, was the senior vice president in idea development at Forrester Research. And he's here today to talk about his book, Writing Without Bullshit, which is a guide to clarity and concision in writing. And I suppose here is where we should mention that if you are particularly sensitive to the non-acronym form of the word BS, uh, this episode may be a non-starter. We, uh, we won't be censoring from here. Yeah, but if you are tired of reading BS, then this episode's <laughs> perfect for you. Absolutely. And uh, I suppose in the spirit of the subject matter of this podcast, uh, we'll uh, cut this intro short and uh, let's kick it over to Josh. Let's do it. Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. So tell us a little bit about uh, your professional journey that led up to the creation of writing, writing without bullshit. Well, really the most notable part of that was the 20 years that I spent as an analyst at Forrester Research. Uh, because of the fact that uh, business people subscribe to Forrester's research reports, there's a huge emphasis there on quality and concision, on getting people exactly the information they need in a very direct way. And uh, so that's really where I learned a lot of the principles that are in the book. The other thing that happened in that position is that because you are a person of influence, you get many, many pitches and press releases from companies that want to tell you about their products. And there was such an enormous quantity of bullshit in that uh, information that got shared with me. I thought, <laughs> right. all right, let's take what I've learned about what works and what doesn't work in this communication and actually share it with people who are out in the business world. Yeah, I can only imagine how much uh, you encountered in that time. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about these uh, WAB surveys that you've done on your site? Well, yeah. So uh, it, one of the principles that we had at Forrester was that you were much better off if you had data. In fact, I was uh, the person who pioneered their uh, their consumer data surveys, wow. uh, which went under the name of Technographics. So once I got out, I said, all right, uh, if I'm going to be telling people about clear writing, then why don't I get in contact with some people who do writing and people who read written content and see what's on their minds. So I designed a survey. We reached over 500 uh, business writers, which we defined as people who spend at least two hours uh, a week on writing outside of email and we found out what was really bothering them, what was on their minds about the stuff that they were reading and about the challenges they had when writing. Interesting. And so I noticed in your book, so you mentioned that kind of bullshit starts in the education system and that the uniformity of the five paragraph essay only has an intro, three paragraphs of argument and so on. And that that sort of continues on to adulthood. Can you expand on that and, and sort of how, what brings us to this point where we begin kind of creating filler in all of our writing? Well, uh, there's sort of two parts of that educational challenge. Um, I noticed this when, when my daughter was actually going to uh, to school and writing classes that they were enforcing this uh, five paragraph theme. Mm. And the challenge with that is that uh, it's designed to make it easy to grade. So that poor teacher has to grade 160 essays across multiple classes. So of course it's a lot easier for them if everything is fit into the same format. Right. There's absolutely no evidence that it, that it actually helps people to write well. And in fact, um, that is not what, goes on in the real world or in the business world, nobody says, well, we need you to make a strategic case for this 
this proposal you have. So why don't you write a five paragraph theme about it? <laughs> right. Um, and of course, when you get to college, it's a different problem. The problem in college is that the people who teach the writing classes are English majors. And right. so they cut their teeth on literary criticism uh, in academic writing. Passive voice is pretty much required. And so they're teaching people to write in a way that just is not appropriate for the business world. And we saw this at Forrester. You got very smart people coming out of college. We hired them at an entry level. And then we had to teach them how to write in a way that would be effective in the business world, which was completely different from what they'd learned in school. Right, right. And so did you did you find that, say, we're going to be diving a little bit more into the book, but um, did you find that these approaches were kind of met with any resistance? Uh, what, what kind of turnaround time did it take to start seeing these results when applying them? Uh, well, everyone can get better immediately. Right. Um, when I actually started in the working world, I started as a technical writer in a startup company. And my editor said, do you realize you're writing everything in the passive voice? And I said, what's that? <laughs> and they showed me and I'm like, Oh, you're right. It's much better if I actually say who's doing the things. Right. Um, and my writing immediately became better. I'm not going to say I was brilliant immediately, but I just went up a notch by just identifying this problem. And that's very much been the case with me helping people, both while I was in that research job and in the five years since then. I see where people's problems are. Is it a problem with ideas? Is it a problem with structure? Is it a problem with language? Is it a problem with jargon? Um, and I help them to see how they can go to the next level and, and improve what they're working on as far as writing goes. You mentioned uh, basically newsletters and press releases are still a big part of business writing and, mm -hmm. um, and almost inherently bombastic and exaggerated. How does a professional newsletter or a as aspiring professional newsletter writer kind of fix that habit and, and change the way they write? Well, there are a few things. Um, first of all is to say things that actually matter. So if I tell you that uh, you you need to have goals in order to be successful, it's like, uh, actually, I've already heard that 762 times. <laughs> right. right. So, so I have, I place a high uh, bar for originality. I really want to see something that I haven't seen before. So if you tell me, well, we did a, a study and we were able to determine that blog po posts that are twice as long actually get more traffic. I'm like, oh, okay. Wow. Right. Actual data. I'm interested in that. Um, uh, and when I'm editing business books or uh, looking at press releases or whatever, I want to actually hear something that's new. We, this is the first time we've been able to do this, or this is 40% faster, or uh, we put together two things in a way that's a lot easier to use. Uh, and that the problem is that that's always surrounded with all of these weasel words, these, you know, greatest, best, most deeply integrated, and none of that stuff has any meaning. And when you cross all of that stuff out, what you're left with is what they should have said in the first place. Some of these releases really should be three sentences, right? Mm -hmm. We released right. a new version. Uh, the old version will stop working in <laughs> in the next three weeks. And it's going to cost have a you price this much. increase, right? I mean, that's what it's going to say, right? But you can't do that because you're selling something. So, uh, there's... well, you know, it's amazing how when people have something useful to sell that's actually better, they it almost sells sell it. itself. So, <laughs> right. so if you're, I mean, for example, uh, Tesla had a a release a while back about the fact that they'd gotten the highest score that that had ever been given by the national. Transportation Safety Administration, excuse me, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration for crashworthiness. That's a real thing, right? Right, right. right. Crash in a Tesla, you're safer than in any other car. That's that's actually a very useful thing to know. Um, you know, Zoom uh, basically was, you know, well, this is actually faster and easier to use and faster growing than any other uh, networking or, you know, video conferencing software. I'm like, what do you know? That's an actual right. thing. The problem is if you're some me too product that that's the same as the other 27 products that have come out, then it's difficult to differentiate. So 
in the book, you also mentioned, so clarity can be dangerous because people might disagree with it. And there's a fear about that. And so outside of workplace communications, I think that writers sometimes fear that their readers will devalue the piece due to lack of length or, or you know, uh, kind of flowery prose. What would you say to writers who are capable of writing concisely, but are scared they won't be taken seriously if they sort of deviate from this societal norm? Uh, get a new job. <laughs> I mean, um, you'd be amazed. Uh, it, it's funny. So I would, I, I'd get these briefings at Forrester and right, some company would come in and they'd say, we have this thing, blah, 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 you know, jargon, jargon, jargon. And I'd say, so basically you're saying that uh, you'll be able to support three streams instead of one with the same hardware. And they're like, yes, that's right. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> good. You could have saved me a lot of time by just saying that. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing that once you clear all this crap out of the way, yes, if you have something to say, people will respect it. And I'm also going to tell you that people have much more respect for, for those who can com communicate clearly than they do for people who just stuff a whole bunch of extra words in. I know. There's this I... feeling of refreshment. It's like, Oh, finally, someone is actually saying what they mean. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I would like to formally apologize for my emails leading up to this. I, I looked back on them and I was like, I sent these to Josh? God. So I'm still, still a student here, still a student in that case. Um, but yeah, so another thing that you mentioned in the book, too, you, you spoke to the chief data scientists over at Chartbeat, and they found that the average reader spends no longer than 30 sec 36 seconds on the average news story. Uh, and so like in the past decade, we've also seen this shift to shorter and shorter articles mm -hmm. with even major news outlets creating bullet points for their stories at the top. Do you think that long form writing even has a place in today's on the go society? And, and, and do you think that there were, we're headed more and more towards a change to more concision in writing? That's an interesting question. So, I mean, I edit books. Right. right. So we're talking 40, 50, 60,000 words. I'd have to say that's long form writing. Right. Um, so there are a few things. First of all, there are there's there's one kind of writing uh, in which it's OK to write long. Um, and that is writing that's designed for entertainment. Right. So if I'm you know, have a short story or even if it's a narrative that's that's nonfiction, but it's like, let me tell you what happened in the first two years that I worked for Google, I'm like, oh, yeah, please tell me a story about that. Yeah. So people can go on at a little bit more length there because the reader is actually enjoying the experience. But if you're talking about writing that's designed to communicate information, then brevity and clarity is really what's most important. I mean, when, when I, in that survey that we talked about, the number one problem people complained about was that the things they read were too long. Right. Um, and they even were willing to admit when I asked them, what's the biggest problem? What you write too long was, was their description of the biggest problem as well. So, uh, yes, to the extent that those things can be replaced by bullet points, they probably ought to be, um, right. if, if a graphic or a chart can communicate that just as well, then there's a lot of value in that. Right, but no one thinks of their own writing that way, right? No one well, thinks I they write too Well, I said that 45% said the biggest problem with my own writing is that it's too long. I, <laughs> it's just, just to, uh, there, there are a couple of things along the lines of what you said. Um, the second largest uh, complaint for people about what they read was that it was poorly organized. Mm -hmm. But only 16% of the people said that what they wrote was poorly organized. So who's <laughs> writing all of this poorly organized? <laughs> it's someone else. It's not me, right? Um, also, when I asked people to rate uh, the, the level of clarity of what they read, uh, like as a group, everything that they read, um, they rated it at a, uh, I think it was a 5.5 on a 10-point scale. So when I asked them the same question about what they wrote, it was a 6.9. So mm. now we know the answer to who writes all of the bad stuff. It's other people. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Everyone but Always me. has been. Right. Yeah. You talk about cutting out the bullshit in management. I've been in situations where a manager was known for being too curt in their communications. 
Is there a danger of being too no bullshit in a corporate setting? Are we as employees conditioned for a certain amount of bullshit? Well, there are a few things. One thing is if you concentrate on the work product, writing or whatever it is, and not the person, then you're better off because, you know, you're stupid. I'm sorry. That doesn't belong in any workplace. Right. That's probably not right. On the other hand, um, this thing that you wrote is too long and it's unclear and it needs to be better. People don't have a problem with that. They're like, okay, well, tell me how to fix that. Um, and you can't, you can't take the criticism on board. Everyone needs to get better at whatever they're doing. And that criticism has to be based on the work product. Um, the other thing, the other thing is that it takes a little while, but people generally warm up to this. Um, my mentor at Forrester was a guy named Bill Bluestein. Um, sadly no longer with us, but, but he would look at what you wrote and he'd like draw a big red X across the last, last two pages of the three pages you wrote. <laughs> and that was, that was a disaster. And he'd write stuff like MP and you're like, what's MP stand for? He said, meaningless platitude, right? <laughs> he used it so often he had an abbreviation for it. <laughs> On the other hand, if, if you got that back and it had like red ink all over it, right? With a lot of detail, you're like, oh, this is good enough to criticize now. Right. He's telling me how this sentence can be better. He's telling me these three bullets would be better if they were in a different order. And at that point you realized, okay, this is, he thinks this is good enough to improve. So I'm going to improve it. What do you think about trends like white papers, which are starting to take and I wouldn't say starting to have been increasingly becoming more popular to the point that even like miscellaneous golf courses will have white papers about things uh, on on their web page, which are inherently long. And I'm not really sure who reads them. What, what, what are your thoughts there? Well, it's I was ready to tell you I thought there were some good things about them until you brought up the golf courses. <laughs> uh, so, yes, I mean, there is a thing called content marketing. Right. And the basic equation of content marketing is if you give me something valuable and useful, I will pay attention. And then perhaps I will believe that you're worth working with, which is, you know, I mean, that's, that's entirely reasonable. So there's pressure on you when you write a white paper to deliver something valuable and useful. And in my mind also, um, unique, right? It's not the same as what everybody else read elsewhere. There are a lot of ways you can do that. You can, uh, for example, pull together 12 examples of something that's a good way to do things. You can have step-by-step -step instructions. You can do a survey and say, here's the results of our survey. Um, I mean, these things are not shockingly different from what we created at Forrester, except that we were trying to be as unbiased as possible. And right. of course, the white papers are always biased toward whatever the, the company believes, but there's, there's value there. And... Yeah, I mean, I think that's fine as long as it's not just, you know, blather going on and on. If it has unique value that's useful for the whatever their target audience is, great, go for it. Right. Mm -hmm. Josh, you were an analyst at Forrester for 20 years, and Forrester is renowned for their ability yeah. to objectively interpret data. Do you think the obsession in objectivity in media, particularly the news media, can lead to a both sidesism approach that can actually have a reverse effect on the audience, make it harder to understand what's true and what's not. Hmm. The problem is that at least as far as politics goes, we're in an era of asymmetric warfare, right? right? You got, you got so much, uh, disinformation coming from one side that, that it's difficult to, to just be even handed. Um, I, I think basically, it, well, I mean, I'm not a journalist. Let's be clear about that. I did not go to journalism school. I was not trained as a journalist. Um, so the question is, are you sharing truth? That's what matters to me. And a journalist has an obligation, I think, to not include bias, but, but for other writers, the question is, can you verify what you're saying? Can you prove it? Are there examples of it? Are there counterexamples? Right. Um, have you quoted people who are authorities? Do you have actual data? These things can all get assembled into something useful and you don't necessarily need to, to show both sides. 
And if you're a journalist, well, it's a tough time now, but I, we, we count on these people to be as, as informative as possible. And so I'm just hoping that they'll, they'll try and keep biases under control and, and hold people to account. Yeah, they're definitely facing a larger challenge in recent years as far as, I guess, combating misinformation more so than ever. So it feels like they're a little bit behind the eight ball in how to adjust in real time to these falsehoods and to be able to report, like you said, with with numbers and and backed up statistics yeah. that, and get to the truth of it. Well, you you see now some stuff that's fascinating, um, like the rise of Daniel Dale at, at CNN, mm-hmm. right? Uh, who is does all this real time fact checking, um, and it's you look at it it's just a prodigious effort um of verifying statements and showing whether they're true or not true and having sources and somebody once asked him my gosh how can you do that all the time how can you keep up with all of these statements from from trump and he said well he tends to tell the same things over and over again (laughs) so he just sort of pulls in oh here's the see here's the one about china i already did that one two weeks ago so i'll just pull that link in and put that in here (laughs) yeah that's not as impressive as we thought daniel (laughs) uh well it's still an essential service Um, not envious it's interesting you see there the the reason journalism has problems is because there's this huge flood of information there are all sorts of people, many of whom are biased and a lot of whom don't even pay any attention to the truth, and they all run websites. And you can look at the website of the New York Times or the or CNN or uh, um, you know the Wall Street Journal, and you can look at the website of the Daily Wire be like, yeah, it looks the same, except that it isn't the same, right? The right. Drudge Report is not a, not a, a dependable source. Um, but what's interesting is that, that finally things are turning around and you have people who react in real time. You have people mm-hmm. who uh, run flash polls and you have, uh, you know, data journalism and you have all of these other forms uh, coming to pass. People like, like you with this podcast, for example. Right. Um, and as a result, the, the flood of misinformation is being met with a flood of actual creative information. And now it's just a question of can we can we find the things that are actual truth? Well, so keeping things kind of uh, seasonally appropriate here, I noticed that you have a pretty interesting WAB survey on the 2020 election, breaking down the linguistic pronouns each candidate used uh, in the town hall on October 15th. So, you know, regardless of political affiliation, like the ability to communicate effectively right now is is probably being discussed more than ever before. Um given the candidates do you have any thoughts about the current situation and 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 sort of how that lack of concision might impact uh voters well i think it's a question of connecting as it always is in politics right so there there's sort of two things going on one is at a rational level and people are looking at trump's performance and biden's performance when he was with barack obama and saying which of these is more like the direction I would like the country to go? Uh, which is more in line with me ideologically? Can I trust this person? Um, but the other thing that happens is an emotional communication. And that's what I found in my analysis of those town halls was that, that it was notable to me that Trump used the words I, me, and my much more frequently than Biden did. Right. Um, and when I looked at the use of the word you, there was a difference in the way that they used it. Trump tended to use it because he was arguing with a moderator, <laughs> whereas uh, Biden was talking about, you know, you're having these issues. This is what we're going to do for you. Uh, and that I think a politician has to do. They need to connect with voters by saying, this is what I'm going to do for you, because I don't think you get very far by just talking about how great you are. Do you think that that's subconsciously, you know, uh heard like whether vocally or in print do you think that readers sort of subconsciously pick that up that there's this uh that the pronouns being used are are communicating sort of a different message well i'm not sure i mean most readers are not going to be able to tell you about the pronouns they got used but they might say sounds like biden actually cares what happens with me right right and and that that 
the pronouns are really just a reflection of a desire to express empathy. Whereas I think that Trump is very much a desire to express dominance, right? Making America great and how, how strongly we're, we're going to be doing things. And, um, and that's, that's a fundamental difference between Democrats and Republicans is Democrats are like, well, we're going to help you out. And the Republicans are like, we're going to make everything strong. Right. And that's yeah. a, that's a choice that people have to make. But it's also a difference between, I guess, political, uh, like, uh, journeyman and businessman too, right? Like you, you talk about using I, we, and you in professional communications as a plus, right? Well, the, when I talk about using I, we, and you, there are a few things. When I talk about using you, it's a way to take your, your writing and direct it so that it's useful to the reader. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what we're going to do for you. You should do these three things. Um, when you have this situation, this is this is what you're going to need to do. Um, and the problem with writing that doesn't do that is it talks in this general way about things that are going to happen and people lose interest. As far as I and we, what I'm recommending is responsibility. So, the for example, the passive voice way of saying things might be um, uh, an update to this system is needed. <laughs> Whereas the, the more direct way to, to say it would be, we need to update this system and we need budget to be able to do that. And to take responsibility for what you're going to do is much easier for the reader to understand than this, you know, okay, they're like, yeah, I guess the system needs to be updated. And then a month goes by and they're like, why didn't anything happen? It's because we didn't figure out who was supposed to do it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. I actually on a, on another seasonal note, I'd like to thank you because I, I learned about the zombies trick uh, from your book, <laughs> which is a great way to identify uh, whether a uh, passage is passive or not. Um, but to kind of wrap it back to the pronouns, I also noticed you have some strong opinions about the third person bio. Can you tell me a little bit about why? <laughs> um. I, this is just a sort of some silliness on my part. Sure. So because I work with authors so much, I'm often reading these bios that they, that are written here. We'll put it in the passive voice that are written uh, about them. You know, uh, you know, Joe Smith graduated with a 4.7 average at, at MIT <laughs> and, and uh, has written seven books and was the CEO of seven companies, three of which were actually profitable. Um, and you know that Joe Smith wrote it, right? Right. So um, I I have a, a version of my bio that I share where it's like, you know, this is what I did. This is my experience. This is who I am, um, which was just a, a sort of a reaction. Now, the weird thing is that when I say I'm giving a speech at some conference, I need to give them the third person bio because <laughs> they can't use one that says I, but, but I just think, you know, when you're reading that, uh, that little page in the back of the book, you're like, this whole book was written by you in the first person. And yet now we're supposed to imagine that the bio was actually written about you by somebody else. Right. Yeah. Like, the invisible sure. secretaries of the <laughs> world. Yeah. I mean, you talk about, uh, weasel words, right? Um, who are the biggest, offenders in using weasel words company-wide like business-wise and who is the opposite who's really who's your favorite as far as clarity and direct communications okay so i want to be clear about what i mean by weasel words yeah yeah first define oh, weasel words yes. for, the, for the audience so a weasel word is uh a word typically an adjective or an adverb that indicates intensity or quality but doesn't actually mean anything so an example would be huge if i say you know there's a, there's a huge advantage in using this product. Well, that doesn't actually tell you anything about it. Um, one of my favorites is deeply, right? When people say it's, you know, it's uh, deeply yeah. integrated or, you know, uh, um, you know, they, they're deeply committed to something. That's just bullshit. It <laughs> doesn't actually mean anything. Um, and the solution or sort of the, the, I guess I should say the reason weasel words are a problem is because when you use enough of them, what's left reads as total bullshit. So there was, for example, a Marissa Meyer statement when she sold Yahoo to Verizon, which I analyzed. And like every other word was one of these, these weasel words. And you just got to the end and you're like, you're totally full of crap. You don't believe any of this stuff. <laughs> um, 
the solution is to actually quantify things. And so I would say that people who do statistical reporting, um, who are reporting on numbers, if you're reporting on how the labor situation has changed in the United States or the results of a survey or, um, you know, benchmarking uh, product performance, those are actually based on numbers. And at that point, you can actually say, oh, this is actually 15% better than that as opposed to these people said deeply and these other people said robust. <laughs> How am I supposed to compare those two things? <laughs> right. So what would be your main, main three ways to kind of cut out the bullshit for, for our writing audience? Um, the first most important one is to put the bottom line up front. Give me in the the title and the first few sentences of what you write or the subject line and the first few sentences, exactly what you mean. Stop beating around the bush and just tell me what that is. Second thing is to write shorter. Um, just remove as much redundancy as you possibly can um, and get things as short as they can be because the people are going to read, um, uh, you know, 150 words or 300 words a lot sooner than they're going to read 2000 words. Um, and I guess the third thing is to be really clear before you write about who you're aiming at. I talk about identifying the reader's objective, the action you want them to perform, and the impression you want to create. There's an acronym for that, which is ROAM. And if you do that analysis first, you're much more likely to get there. Yes, impression doesn't start with M, <laughs> but I started with that a little bit because nobody you knows can remember you Roy. You saw so, my reaction to that, didn't you? <laughs> so, so uh, that's, uh, those things are all things that, that people can concentrate on that will make a great deal of difference in their being perceived as uh, clear and direct communicators. All right. The Rome method. Yes. Well, is there anything else that uh, you're working on these days? Anything you'd like to plug before we wrap up here? Well, I, I'm especially focused on helping people who write business books. So if people are writing or uh, and they need an editor or a ghostwriter or just some help with positioning. Uh, that's what I've focused mostly on. And I also work with companies. Uh, if the comp if companies want to put these methods in place, I'm doing these uh, video conferencing based workshops. It's two sessions of an hour and a half makes a great deal of difference very quickly. So, and I don't know why, but after three or four years of this, it's suddenly taking off right now. <laughs> I, got, I got, I think because people are stuck at their desk and they're yeah. like, what can we help people uh, with training on while they're stuck at their desk? Oh, they can get, do better writing. So, yeah. so uh, that's, that's been very popular recently. Oh, well, I think we should uh, keep it as concise as possible here. And uh, I think you broke the record for cursing on the scripted podcast. And I appreciate that. Yes. Yeah, I, I am not a profane person. I don't curse a lot. But when it, the time came to write about this, uh, there was only one way to call it, which is to call it bullshit. I call it what it is. It's funny. When I pitched the book to publishers, I had as a condition that they wouldn't change the title. And uh, in general, they went along with it. And when I, when I asked the publisher I ended up working with, I said, are you okay with the title? They're like, well, we read the proposal and you have to call it that. What else could you call it? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, you understand. We can work together. <laughs> well, we're huge fans, and, and thank you so much for coming on to the show today, Josh. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, take care now. All right, so there we go. There we have it. Lots to unpack there. Uh, any takeaways that you have uh, from this, uh, Kevin? Well, I think I'm going to be doing... Um, a thorough review of my own writing um, <laughs> yeah. for sure and get rid of make sure I'm not using any weasel words for sure you right, know, I, right. I hate to be considered a weasel word writer there are better animals I think mm -hmm. at least for that comparison but also addition to weasel words but passive voice and use of jargon it's all great advice uh, and I think especially in marketing copy you can find yourself being overly bombastic or using jargon and once you cut it he's right it's clearer and it's more convincing i actually feel like you know and i have absolutely zero data to prove this but i feel as if um 
jargon has increased considerably in the last decade or more. And then there are occasionally times where I'm reading things and think about like, say, like, does an 80 year old even know what's being discussed right. in this article that was being put out for the general public? Right. Yeah. I feel that on social media, especially like there's like this short form where you have to translate it the first time you see it and then it becomes regular nonsense in your sure. head. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that one, the internet as a whole has just become so meta where it's like, mm -hmm. you, there are things that are being referenced that aren't even being discussed, but understood by all parties. Right. It's like, you know, this means something about a meme in 2013. And then it evolved to this term <laughs> that everyone seems to understand means this other thing. That's right. Yeah, no, and I, I totally know what you mean. So leading up, as I mentioned too in the show, in the interview here with Josh, I, uh, in the weeks leading up to this episode, I had emailed him a few times and then, and then I went back to look at my replies and Josh, Josh lives his words. His uh, his email replies are brief. <laughs> they are exceptionally brief. And when I looked at the email that he was replying to, I was just deeply ashamed of myself. And even there you go, deeply. <laughs> so, yeah. You're just ashamed. But, but that does the, yeah, does the job. I was just ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's what I mean. I think once you start applying these rules, you know, you you start to realize how much more of it is. And I think with our writers, there's a really good opportunity here to. Kind of take a look at what you're you're writing mm. you know obviously i think all writers don't want to fall into the hole of being like the college essay you know right. i'm gonna fill this out i'm gonna pat it out um sometimes that happens when you have word counts mm -hmm. but it, i think if you do this and you do it every day with your writing it'll challenge you to push more content out of something it's not always going to be a case of drawing blood from a stone um, i think it'll push creativity on your end it'll make you a better writer and it's a tough balance. And and as Josh said, it's not for every piece of writing. Right. You know. Um, but marketing and some, business writing especially. Yeah, absolutely. For, for, for writers, it might be difficult at first to judge your writing and make these cuts. But then eventually it'll become secondhand and your writing will actually move faster. Yeah, exactly. And then not only that, one interesting thing that happens when you when you apply this to your own writing is that any words that you use that are sort of supportive or attempting to reinforce a point adjectives pop a lot more when there aren't thousands of them per sentence that's true absolutely you know i mean uh, you know obviously this this uh this podcast had its share of swear words but that's kind of the same thing with swear words right mm -hmm. it's like if you use it 15 times in a sentence it's nowhere near uh as powerful and it's the same thing uh with with your writing in general so that's one thing I think. I also had mentioned in the discussion um, about the zombie test, which I had learned from Josh's book. And the way that that breaks out is uh, essentially that if you can finish the sentence with by zombies, then that means that the sentence is passive. Can you give us an example of that? Yeah, so, so uh, um, the prescription was filled by zombies. Mm -hmm. The book was written by zombies. If it makes sense with by zombies and the zombies, a by zombies is occurring after the verb, uh, then that sentence is passive. It has a few exceptions, um, but it was actually developed by um, one of the like educational sources for the U.S. Armed Forces uh, for like when you know those guys are in school, uh, and it works pretty well. It's a neat little trick. I wish we had gotten this episode out before Halloween, but hey. I know. We well, where we're, where we're actually launching this episode is, you know, as with any podcast, we record some of this stuff in advance and then other parts we do at other times. And right now we're right on the cusp of the uh, the election. So the next episode uh, that you'll be joining us will be in the, the after times. Mm -hmm. But this was recorded in the before times. <laughs> we're in the limbo that's right well all right well thanks josh for being on the show and i hope you guys uh learned a lot uh from josh and his uh writing without bullshit yeah and uh we'll be including some links be sure to check out his blog it is an excellent read if you loved what you heard of josh there's a lot more of it and uh we hope you join us on the next podcast be sure to uh like us on apple subscribe and uh 
subscribe, hit the bell, hit that notification button, do it all, and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode. Yeah.